I'm Ed Perlani from the University of Buffalo, here with my two graduate students. Uh, we're, I'm going to be talking about uh, multi-physics and multi-scale simulations, uh, and then giving you some examples of not only basic research, but translational research as well, and some co industry collaborations. Um, I'm, as, as uh, was noted, I'm at UB, and I'm with a joint appointments in the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering and Electrical Engineering, but that's very recent. Uh, I transitioned there in 2011. Before that, I had over 20 years of experience in Eastman Kodak Research Labs where I directed computational modeling for the development of many, many commercial materials and devices. And I've transported that learning, those learnings to UB and extended them into a new, uh, my computational group. So largely what I do is uh, in my group we do micro and nanostructured materials, looking at fundamental principles and, device and, and design of uh, new materials and devices. Photonics, uh, we do light, we're gonna be uh, presenting today about some fundamental light matter interactions, spe specifically around the phenomenon of plasmonics. We do do computational fluid dynamics, transport phenomena, and um, multi-phase flow. I'll be talking a little bit about inkjet systems, but different than what you're used to, I'll be talking about inkjet printing of liquid metals, which is we're doing with uh, in collaboration with the local company. Uh, I also do microfluidics MEMS, uh, design and simulation, all these things were integrated over, accumulated over many, many years in industry. And lastly, I've had a lot of experience doing computational magnetics, uh, basically the development, the use of rare, high strength rare earth magnets for magnetic systems and devices and field generation. Why do you need multi-physics and multi-scale simulation? Because with the modern capability to engineer materials at the nano to micro scale, you can, you, can in, you can engineer in their properties at a very small scale to realize a macro scale behavior. So no longer is it adequate to simply do macro scale modeling. Yes, they have material properties that you input into the models, but if you really want to do materials by design or devices by design, you have to really be able to model all the way from the electronic atomistic all the way up to the macro scale. I'm, my work focuses mostly on micro and macro scale, nano scale, uh, some nano scale simulations involving self-assembly, but this is really uh, the future of what the kind of capability you're going to need and for the going forward. So all of these are um, COMSOL animations, and um, I'm going to be talking today, we're going to be talking today about photonics applications, uh, liquid metal printing applications, self-assembly, and so forth. Three, these three areas that I work in, among others, are computational electromagnetics and photonics, Computational fluid dynamics and microfluidics. These are linked by the fluid, pro the E and M properties of the of the fluids, and also Brownian dynamics, which really you use to do self assembly. Um, we're going to be talking about electric stimulation, wound healing, uh, self assembly of pla magnetoplasmonic particles, the optical properties and photothermal properties of metallic nanostructures, and some uh, a new technology uh, based on magnetohydrodynamics, where it allows you to print. I can see it here. You can print um, uh, print uh, solid metal pieces using liquid metal. It, when coming to UB, I established a laboratory for interdisciplinary modeling and simulation. I have ten currently have ten graduate students, which fluctuates uh, from year to year. Three undergraduates. We run our these console simulations on these high performance workstations. There's some typical typical workstations in my laboratory. More importantly, we leverage the Center for Computational Research. I'll be talking today about, one of my students will be talking today about the implication of the ComCell server in a, in a high performance computing environment. I believe we're one of the first sites to, to academic sites to do this. This center has 200, 250 terabytes of compute capacity and four petabytes of storage. And more recently, we, we uh, had installed a dedicated industrial modeling cluster courtesy of the Empire State Development and ISTAR High Performance Computing Consortium involving our Rensselaer, UB, and Stony Brook. And we have four seats to the console server. We'll be talk, showing you examples on the implementation of this and their use. Since we're going to be talking about plasmonics, for those of you that, that are not familiar with it, I'll just briefly introduce you to this concept. For our purposes, plasmonics involve the electromagnetic induction of coherent oscillation of electrons in nanoparticles, metallic nanoparticles. Here's a magnetic nanoparticle in fluid. Here's an incident plane wave. It's very important that the particle will be much smaller than the incident wavelength, much smaller, 10 to 1, for example. So the particle, all the electrons in the, all the free electrons in the particle see the field in one direction at any given instant in time. Here the field is pointing up. 
and the electrons, of course, move in, in the opposite direction. The particle is stationary, but the electron cloud moves down. Here the field is down, the electrons move opposite to that, and the electron cloud moves up very rapidly, creating a dipole oscillation pattern. Now the principle of, of plasmonics is this is greatly enhanced at the nanoscale using these metallic nanostructures. You can understand that in a very simplistic sense by looking at the dipole moment of such a, of, of a spherical particle. And you note here that in the denominator, we have this term, the permittivity of the, of the particle minus, uh, plus two times the permittivity of the background medium. Suppose, just suppose for example, that could be zero. Then this would be huge, you'd get large scattering, large absorption. Well, for me metallic particles and optical frequencies, this is the permittivity, and you can see that these are large negative numbers. So this, this condition can be realized, which produces a plasmon resonance, which gives you tremendous optical absorption and local field enhancement. And for silver and gold particles, these happen around 500 nanometers in the short wavelength, green, greenish colors. Why is plasmonics important? It has spawned tremendous uh, new technology in the particle synthesis to realize these particles. They're used extensively for biochemical sensing. They're used extensively for theragnostics, that is the, the ability, uh, the combination of therapy and diagnostics, where you inject the particles into humans or small animals in this case, and you can do, because of this enhanced field, enhanced, uh, enhanced uh, optical performance, you can do not only imaging, but you can heat the particles and actually cause uh, therapeutic, you can cause cell damage by hyperthermia. They're also used for spectroscopy. Please pay special note to this. We're, we're, in some of the work we do, we're looking at these hybrid particles where the core is magnetic and the shell is plasmonic or gold. These are still 50 below 100 nanometer particles, but we use these combinations in order to guide the, the assembly of these particles using an external field. So we get the benefits of self-assembly, guided assembly, controlled the motion of the particles, and these rich plasmonic effects. I'll now introduce my two students, Kai Lu and Victor. Shukahatsky. Kai is doing fundamental light matter interactions involving plasmonics, and Victor is an expert in quasi-static field theory. He's, he will introduce you to the ComCell server, the implementation of it in high-performance computing, and also several in industrial applications. So, Kai? Uh, first, thank you uh, for uh, thank Dr. Fani's uh, introduction. And uh, as uh, Dr. Fani mentioned, uh, plasmonic behaviors of uh, colloidal nanoparticles is very important for the uh, biomedical applications. And uh, for in this slide, I'm showing the scope of uh, our uh, uh, academic studies on the light matter interactions. Uh, first, uh, we prefer, we use the uh, console to perform the uh, numerical studies on the optical and photosomal behaviors of uh, uh, isolated plasmonic uh, nanoparticles. And then including caution nano rod and uh, nano cage and other kinds of uh, nanoparticles. So this figure shows the photosomal profiles. And uh, beyond that, we also uh, developed the MATLAB model to account for the self assembly behaviors uh, to assemble those magnetic plasmonic nanoparticles. So it can be divided into two cases. The first case is, uh, is shown on the left figure, it's a self assembly of uh, the single chain structures based on those particles. And the second case, we use uh, actually a nano uh, structure, the magnetic template to assemble, assemble those particles into the more complicated uh, shape. This figure shows uh, the heptomer. It's uh, consisting of uh, seven, part uh, seven uh, cultural particles in an array. And this specific design is very useful and it can support the final resonance specifically. And one another point I want to mention about our work is uh, our simulation work is based on the practically uh, synthesized plasmonic nanoparticles, uh, has, which has been demonstrated in previous works, uh, ranging from the nano rod, uh, core shell, uh, nano cube, and even the nano ring structure. On the right figure, this is uh, the typical comp computational domain we are using in the console software. And we actually put uh, the nano cage structure into it and account for and study its uh, uh, optical behaviors. As shown by this figure, we are plotting the local field enhancement profile of the nano cage. So uh, in this slide, this slide is showing a comparison work uh, of the 
uh, uh, local feeling enhancement profile and the thermal heating profile of for two mostly po two most uh, two most uh, popularly used uh, uh, colloidal nanoparticles, which are the uh, nano cage and cold shell structures. On the first row, is a comparison of the photothermal behaviors of the uh, two particles. On the second row, is a comparison of uh, the local field enhancement profile of those two structures. And uh, we get a conclusion that the nano cage can, can actually provide a superior local field enhancement profile because it can support a strong hot spots in the interior as well. So uh, it also has the comparable heating in, compar in comparison with that of the cultural structure. So they uh, move forward beyond the, the, that work, we also coupled the console RF and the heat transfer modules to study the, actually the thermal dynamics of those two nanostructures. Although the, there are, uh, is a big difference in the compute um, composition, material composition and structure details of two structure. However, you can still observe a very similar temperature rising profile in the surrounding fluids. And uh, this work is enabled by this equation. On the left side is the heat transfer equation. On the right side, cool plasma is actually the optical induced the draw heating. And uh, this slide, we want to show you uh, the application of uh, polymonic enhanced nanoparticle, or say the nanomedicine, for the photo cancer therapy, photosomal cancer therapy, and the imaging applications. During the practice, we can actually first uh, inject the nanoparticles, or say the nanomedicine, into the body, and uh, then we use the pulse laser to illuminate uh, the nanoparticles in the body, and it will generate uh, heat. To uh, and then generate uh, nanobubbles around it. The explosion force of the nanobubble can necessarily kill the cancer around it. So this is uh, the typical, uh, 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 very typical example based on the nano cage structure. We first injected the nano cage into the body, and uh, this nano cage can actually absorb the light strongly in the near infrared region upon the illumination of the. Uh, laser and the af actually after the polymonic nanomedicine or nanoparticle has been taken uh, uptaken uh, into the HeLa cells, uh, we, we, we observed the cell destruction through those uh, bubble generation behaviors as shown uh, actually uh, as shown in this video. You can see the nanobubble can actually generate it uh, around the nanoparticles and merge together and then uh, I then uh, and expand and explode to like kill the cancer cells. So beyond that, uh, we actually developed MATLAB codes to uh, study the cell assembly behaviors of those magnetic polymorphic nanoparticles uh, based on the magnetic template, and we uh, and we then extract the positions of individual particles in those uh, uh, arrays and load it into our console model to study, to continue to study the optical interactions and behaviors in the individual uh, colloidal cluster. And uh, we found that this heptamer cluster can support the final resonance, and it's very useful for the bell sensing application because uh, the uh, external perturbation of the interactions among those particles. And we also further plot the local field and the current profiles to further study the physics uh, underlying, under, underlying uh, 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 explanations for those final features. Similarly, we use the same uh, MATLAB code to study the sample assembly behaviors during the sample assembly of those single chain structures based on the same uh, magnetic polymorphic and particles. And uh, we base, uh, and then we extract positions and uh, load it into a console model, and uh, we to perform the study on the optical behaviors, and uh, we study we uh, study the correlation between the absorption spectrum and the particle uh, number in the chains, and uh, we also found uh, those chains can not only concentrate the like uh, the electric field strongly in the, those nano gaps, it can also concentrate the heat at the center of the uh, of the chain. So those uh, optical 
behaviors on the heat, gener heat gener generation profiles of the chain can be very useful for the biosensing and the photothermal therapy applications. Uh, and uh, uh, then I will hand the microphone over to my partner, Victor. He will continue to talk about a very amazing uh, industrial works uh, going in our group. Thank you, Kai. Uh, so besides the some of the basic science that we do in our lab, we also get involved in some of the more translational research that we do at the lab. And I'll talk to you about three of the projects that we've done, um, and gotten ourselves involved with over the last year and a half. and those being uh, an inductive traffic loop sensing uh, project, uh, a um, electric stimulation wound healing uh, technology that we've been working on recently, and a 3D metal printing uh, technology based on the concept of magnetohydrodynamics. And the center of all of these three projects is uh, the Comsol application builder and Comsol solver that we've actually been able to use in our high performance uh, computing cluster over in Buffalo. So let me get started on that. Uh, so both of the previous presenters have mentioned the importance of uh, the design cycle and to speed up the design cycle. So the idea behind, uh, the, the idea that we uh, have been able to implement uh, with the help of the application solver and the high performance cluster was to accelerate this design cycle in such a way that it removes both the complexity of the, uh, of the console interface for the end user that may not be an expert in using console. And uh, coupled with that, if we, uh, during the design cycle, we will uh, uh, improve our model over and over again, and they may become very complicated, and it may take days and weeks to solve. So in the end, uh, a high performance cluster will accelerate that part of, uh, of the uh, simulation. So on, over on the slide on the left, you see the typical, uh, 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 typical interface that you're all used to seeing, and on the right, uh, we see the console server uh, interface, which essentially acts as a, a substitute for the solver, and uh, the user uh, can launch applications in the solver and then uh, solve them parametrically by only varying several parameters that are pre-designed by the person who made the application. So um, here I'll talk about our first project, so uh, please don't hold in your breakfast. We're all, we always made, almost made it to lunch. It's a little bit gross, but I have to go through it. So over on the top left, uh, we have a clinical study based on a patient who has a, uh, we haven't done the study, but we're quoting the study. It's a, a patient who has had a chronic wound for five years. So a chronic wound is a wound that doesn't heal by itself because of a disruption in the natural healing process. And uh, there's evidence to suggest, suggest that electrical stimulation uh, therapy can enable the healing of such wounds and even accelerate them further than a natural process can, uh, can make it happen. So once again, this is still ongoing research that we're doing. And uh, on the bottom left, you can see a, uh, an, an application that, that we've made for a model that we've built and an application that we've made for our partner, Garwood Medical Devices, who, uh, in, in which there is a uh, simplified version of an arm and uh, there's an incision in the middle and we have the several layers of a typical human uh, body part where there's skin, fat, muscle, uh, bone, and then the marrow. And for each one of those, we have the appropriate parameters, frequency dependent parameters, uh, which uh, 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 have been taken from literature and compiled into this model. And so the idea is you stimulate uh, the, the area around the wound or on, on the wound. There are several different configurations that you can do, and uh, it causes a, a fluctuation in current density around it, and uh, there's still ongoing research on how this exactly happens, but there's evidence that just to suggest that it uh, accelerates the healing of the wound. So the second project I want to talk to you about is an inductive loop traffic sensor uh, to enable intelligent transportation systems. And uh, this is something that's actually being used today. If you pull up to a tra traffic light, oftentimes in the ground you'll see a wire embedded in, in, the, pa in the pavement in front of you. And the reason for that is uh, the, the wire itself is uh, uh, energized with, uh, at a resonant mode. And uh, when a vehicle passes over this loop, uh, it distorts the, the magnetic flux density above it, which in, change, in, in turn changes the resonant uh, functioning of the loop, changes the inductance, and changes the impedance of the uh, loop, and which can be uh, used as a sensing mechanism for detecting a vehicle above it. So uh, well, the question that was really posed in our part of the research is, do steel belts have an effect on the sensing mechanism of the loop? So steel belts are something that was used in an old style, old style tires in vehicles where the steel belts were used for structural support of the tire. 
newer belts use nylon belts or other synthetic materials that are not magnetically active. So the idea is because the wheel is the closest thing to the inductive loop, it will be the first thing sensed by the loop. And if it's the first thing sensed by the loop uh, and uh, the, the steel belts are absent, maybe we need to rethink the sensitivity of the mechanism. So the real question was, do the steel belts have a uh, have an effect on the sense, sensing mechanism? mechanism? And what we've found out is, that yes, it does. So there's a pronounced uh, pronounced difference in the inductive change when a loop, uh, when the loop, when the wheel has belts versus when it doesn't, and uh, that's where we sort of wrapped up the project. We've also gone into exploring it in three dimensions, but that was at a later stage in the project. So the last project I'll talk about today is a new technology based on th or to enable 3D liquid metal printing. So this is huge in the manufacturing industry. And uh, with the machine itself, uh, there's already a prototype that, that actually prints these parts, uh, and the prototype is shown over here. Uh, it's quite a complicated machine, but at the heart of the, the process is this uh, ejection chamber over here. Uh, it's about five to 10 centimeters big. It's much, simple, much more simplified here, but the idea is you have molten metal in a reservoir, uh, solid metal is fed in, in from the top of the reservoir, it melts in the reservoir, and then in a magnetic pulse is applied to to, uh, to uh, cause eddy currents inside the metal. The eddy currents then cr create their own magnetic field coupled to the external magnetic field and that creates a pressure to eject a droplet. So you see a droplet ejection over here, over here below on the bottom. It eject ejects a droplet. This is done up to a thousand times a second and when the droplets eject, they solidify on a substrate to create a solid part. So up top, uh, over here in the top, to the top right, you can see an actual video of a droplet ejecting with the scale in the background to measure the velocity. And of course, uh, there are some real printed parts, of course, a cat. And uh, uh, this cat, this is an actual printed cat, not modified, straight out of the printer. And then uh, over on, on the top uh, right, you see a ring structure that was on the bottom straight out of the printer and then finished and processed to a nice polish after the fact. So. This whole process was really based on the physics of magnetohydrodynamics. You have uh, electromagnetics coupling to uh, a computational fluid dynamics, and then you have the heat transfer to an analyze the molten metal and how it solidifies into a solid stru structure. And all of these projects we've been able to accelerate with the help of the COMSOL server, making apps for these uh, for these projects and accelerating them on a, uh, accelerating the solution time of the of these projects on on the high performance computing cluster. So I'll hand it over to Dr. Flani to finish up with some remarks, and then we'll have some questions afterwards if you guys have any. Yeah, just one brief remark about the the, the COMSOL server is that it removes it's uh, it's driven by a custom designed GUI that you build from the application builder. So you're running COMSOL the way all of us run COMSOL. You develop an application and you design a GUI. And that GUI is, have, you have in mind what the end user is going, the parameters that the end user is going to vary. So the end user uh, doesn't have to know, certainly doesn't have access to the model to be able to modify the model and doesn't have access, maybe they don't have the engineering skills, but they do have the ability to, to enter param parameters into this custom design GUI and run the, run the program over and over again. So it extends, it actually extends this computational capability, say, to non-experts, right? Uh, lastly, I want to say that this work has been, has been ongoing. I built this up over, like I said, probably five or six years. The fundamental uh, computations, uh, we have several different projects, but the ones presented have been supported by NSF. Uh, and then I'm constantly uh, in, uh, collaborating with industries, and uh, I very much value the support of Vader Systems, uh, Xerox, and Garwood Medical, more recently Garwood Medical. And then none of this would be possible without uh, this great computational infrastructure that transcends my lab. A special help has been given uh, uh, by the Center of Computational Research at UB. Uh, Center of Materials Informatics has been very critically important here. And then this, uh, this consortium, the Empire State Development and NYSTAR High Performance Consortium, which has basically funded uh, and put in place this industrial cluster, which will allow us to, uh, to help grow economic development. And I'll take any questions now.